Good morning, everyone. Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Uh, welcome back. Uh, happy October. Uh, this is a very special gathering for us today because we're commemorating what was happening 60 years ago this very day, 18 October 1962. The Cuban Missile Crisis had just begun. It's the closest that the U.S. and the Soviet Union ever came to a uh, full-on, full-blown nuclear Armageddon during the Cold War. Uh, it's something that people are thinking about a lot again these days. It happens to be the 60th anniversary. It also happens to be the sort of thing that's still looming in people's minds, uh, low these 60 years later. Uh, a lot has been done um, by us and others uh, about the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's an endlessly fascinating subject because of how close civilization really came. Um, and it's almost sort of an iconic event of the Cold War, one of the most, and certainly uh, of the storied administration of John F. Kennedy as well. And everybody remembers the photo of uh, JFK uh, as he made the announcement of the naval blockade of Cuba when it was found out that Soviet ballistic missile sites had been built there. Um, little backstory, this had been, uh, we had put some... Um, Jupiter missiles, I believe they were, uh, in the proximity of the Soviet Union's backyard, uh, Italy and Turkey. And this, by way of sort of tit for tat, now just 90 miles off America's coast, these um, ballistic missile silos threatened the entire North American continent. Um, and one can imagine somebody growing up in, say, the Washington, D.C. area, 1962, and um, being aware of that map that shows the where we are in relation to where these missiles can hit. It's pretty much stretched all the way across North America um, from that very dangerous site. Obviously, with the Monroe Doctrine and um, the mere fact of existential threat, uh, this was not something that President Kennedy was going to be able to let stand. What happened in those um, 13 tense days in October of 1962 basically determined the course of mankind's future. Uh, and this is, of course, because it was such a profound event, it's been looked at in many kinds of angles. But one angle of it that we ourselves had not been very aware of, and I doubt our readers had been as well until this current issue of Naval History magazine, was the previously highly classified role of Canada and the Canadian Royal Navy in supporting the U.S. Navy and protecting the Western Hemisphere during this crisis. And we're thrilled to have in the magazine this issue, and here with us today, Michael Whitby, who is the senior naval historian with Canada's Department of National Defense, at least for one more week until he retires. Congratulations. Um, Michael, it's great to see you, and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Eric, it's great to be here. Welcome. Hi from Canada. <laughs> yes. Yes. We have a Canadian guest today, folks. Um, <laughs> talk about a Canadian topic, the role of Canada in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, at the time, this was largely not known. Uh, it was kept quite secret, um, but uh, Canada played a crucial role in this, and uh, Michael's going to tell us about that today. Uh, Michael, why don't you just uh, set the stage for us and um, give us a sense of uh, how the coordination happened and uh, what Canada's role was. Sure. Uh, first, let me give you some Cold War context to this, and this is the the threat people felt and the fear people have, the anxiety about nuclear warfare in 1962. And here's the example. In November of 1961, the Canadian government put on a nationwide exercise uh, of a simulated nuclear attack on Canada. It was called Exercise Talks in T-O-C-S-I-N. And it took place again in November 61, a year before the Cuban Missile Crisis. And what happened was they simulated an attack on Canada by 262 Soviet bombers with nuclear weapons, as well as ballistic missiles coming over the, the North Pole and launched from submarines in the North Atlantic. So at seven o'clock that evening, and I remember this, I was a kid, I was young, but I was a kid, I still remember this. Um, Air raid sirens went off in all the cities of Canada, and people, whether they wanted to or not, some did, some didn't, took shelter like there was a nuclear attack. And my little family with my brother and sister and my parents, and probably the dog too, went hid under the basement stairs uh, when the sirens went off. I remember that very clearly. 
afterwards, when they had the wash up for this exercise, the um, government officials and military officials estimated that in such an attack of that size, 12 of our cities would be hit and 2.6 million Canadians would have died. That's out of 18 million population in 1962. So the fact that we practiced exercise the nuclear attack tells you how serious it was taken by people and how it was stuck in their brains all the time. So when November 62 happened, October 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis, people were, you know, rightfully scared, you know, nervous. I remember I was living on a naval base in Shearwater, which is sort of our Pensacola in Nova Scotia. My father was on the op staff. He sort of disappeared for two weeks. My mother is English and she'd gone through the bombings in the uh, in her country in the Second World War, she'd look out her farmhouse window and see Manchester burning during 1940 Blitz. So she was well aware of, of, of a war and, and what it meant. And on base housing, she asked, you know, what happens if there's an attack? And people said, you're on your own. So she just bought some more groceries and we, you know, hunkered down. Um, Eric made reference to the fact that this is classified at the time in Canada. Um, the reason for that, one of the and one of the, the sidebars of that, is all the documents, all the operational documents that a Navy typically produces during an operation such as a Cuban Missile Crisis. All the documents were destroyed. Um, they were ordered to be destroyed. Um, my my former boss was the operations officer with the, one of the frigate squadrons, and he recalls recalls quite well his commanding officer saying, "Open the safe alloc and destroy all the documents." So this was the signals. There were no exercise or operation reports written afterwards. So this was probably done. I think I can't. I don't know who made the order, but I can guess. Um, Canada's participation in the crisis came as a result of bilateral agreements with the United States. And these went back to 1940, before Pearl Harbor. Um, the Prime Minister of Canada and FDR met in Augsburg, New York, and hammered out agreements of how they would handle continental defense in a war that was coming. Of course, Canada was already in the war at that time. But I think the United States knew it was just a matter of time. Um, so they hammered out military agreements. And these lasted throughout the Second World War. The Canadian Navy and the United States Navy and the Battle of the Atlantic worked seamlessly together, often Canada under American control, but sometimes the other way around later in the war. Um, after the war, when the Cold War started in 1947, they agreed that this relationship had to continue, and they in fact made it stronger. So what that resulted in was a series of bilateral naval and military agreements um, that would handle an emergency situation such as war or the threat of war. And so this was developing war plans. And what happened in October 1962, in fact, on this date, 60, 60 years ago, uh, Vice Admiral Whitey Taylor, who was the United States Navy's um, commander of anti-submarine warfare with the Atlantic Fleet, was leaving Shearwater. He'd been there for two days of meetings with Rear Admiral Dyer, who was our naval commander on the, uh, on the East Coast. And they were setting up what they would do given the amount of traffic that was increasing on the oceans of Soviet ships heading to Cuba. There's no way on earth that Dyer was told then about the missiles because I don't think the Americans had really confirmed their existence yet, or if they had, they were keeping it very hush-hush. But what they were doing was the situation, the tension was increasing. There was a significant um, increase in Soviet traffic heading to Cuba, merchant ship traffic, etc. And uh, they met to decide how they would deal with this. And so how are we going to surveil the oceans and keep an eye on what's happening? Um, so that happened uh, 60 years ago today. And throughout the crisis, Vice Admiral Taylor and Rear Admiral Dyer, so under SACLANT rules and NATO rules and bilateral agreements, Vice Admiral Taylor was essentially Admiral Dyer's superior officer throughout this operation. Canadian responsibility was the Canland zone, which ran down to 40 degrees north latitude, which is just, uh, just south of New York City, actually. So it encroaches into American seas if you want to call them that and it covered all the way up of course to, to the arctic circle and out to 60 degrees longitude which is the the greenland so we had a big area of responsibility to look after um and we did that with the united states now one key thing that's important to know is the united states and canada were also members of nato and throughout this crisis the americans made a decision that this was a national emergency not 
a NATO-wide emergency. That way, I think they could control more of what was going on. Uh, security was an issue also. But under these bilateral agreements with Canada, hemispheric defense, be, a national emergency for the United States became a national emergency for Canada, although we didn't express it that way, but it, essentially it was. And so almost automatically, our Navy responded um, to the situation and worked seamlessly with the Americans throughout. Um, yeah, that makes, yeah, that makes special sense, doesn't it? I mean, uh, it's a, a U U.S. and Canada show because it's a North American uh, specific issue. So it kind of made sense to keep it that way. Sure. And the um, the combined uh, effort of the two navies created what they called the Stonewall Barrier, correct? Which pretty much, yes. like you say, was a seamless line um, from north all the way down. So, And that had to help the U.S. fleet quite a bit in it, dispensing its assets further southward uh, to the Cuban theater zone and the, the uh, blockade and all that. So Yeah, the Stonewall Barrier is interesting because this, again, is a war plan. So if there's an emergency, they know the Soviet submarines would come to North American waters. And they're worried about missile firing submarines, especially because, you know, if, if you hunt them after they've launched their missiles, it's too late. And then they're launching nuclear missiles with a range of about 600 miles at that time. So they were a real threat. They were very, very concerned about this. Um, so the Stonewall Barrier ran from the the south coast of Newfoundland, 600 miles into the southeast Atlantic, and it composed of 10 American conventional anti-submarine submarines, SSKs, and in front of that, a 150-mile swath of maritime patrol aircraft. Um, about 80% of those were, flew out of Argentia, Newfoundland. They were U.S. Navy Neptunes, but they did not have the linger time over the southern extremity, the southeast extremity, so Canadian Argus has covered that throughout the... Uh, throughout the crisis. Um, the thing about the Stonewall thing, and this is where some of the political issues arose, I think, um, a lot of work still has to be done there, is that that was in Canadian, in the Canadian can land zone, not our territorial waters, but our zone of, of control under NATO. And so that was resurrected, erected, I guess, um, automatically almost. And we allowed that to happen. We said yes, and we'll participate. And, but that's, the prime minister, I believe, looked at the Canadian zone and said, why are we having American forces there? And why wasn't I given an opportunity to approve this? And I think that's the politics of this. And again, people are still trying to get to the bottom of that to this day. Uh, the Stonewall Barrier, I think it was erected, I believe, the 10 submarines finally got there about the 19th, 20th, 21st um, of October. And it wasn't taken down until the 10th of November. So it sat there for an awful long time throughout the entire crisis. As far as I can understand um, through my research, uh, they didn't pick up any submarine contacts because there weren't any submarines coming directly down that route. But if the crisis had continued and the Soviets were putting missile boats into North American waters, that's where they would have come. And the interesting thing about the NATO thing, if NATO had been involved, that barrier probably would have been in the old, you know, Geoc gap, the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, it would have moved there probably. And that would involve our allies, again, the British, the French, all taking part. And the Americans, again, wanted to keep this local, I guess is a good word for it, national. So that's why it remained where it was. But under NATO war plans, the Stonewall barrier would have gone uh, much further out into the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it, and this is the most important thing about uh, this operation in many ways from a naval viewpoint in the Canadian area and the American area is SOSIS. Okay, so the Americans established a number of SOSIS stations up the East Coast, and because submarines would come in the Great Circle Road, Canada had a station at Shelburne, Nova Scotia, just south of Halifax, and there was an American station at, at Argentia, Newfoundland. And from the research we've done, uh, we found that Almost all the operations the Canadians did during this crisis were either protecting the SOSIS system or getting ready to use its information to pounce on possible contacts. And even when we moved south into the American zone later in the crisis to help out there so you guys could devote your forces down near Cuba, um, all the operations were centered very closely to SOSIS stations. So that's the key to the whole thing. And we had, uh, the Americans and the Canadians had put I think, how can I best express this? They put great reliability on SOSIS to be able to tell us where so Soviet submarines are going to be. 
The Cuban Missile Crisis was the first real operational practical test of that, and it ran into some problems, which they weren't aware of, although they suspected, I think. Um, here's one. There were 550 Soviet fishing vessels in the Northwest Atlantic in June 1962. 550. Many of those were, were were regular fishing vessels, but some were spy ships, and and there was great anxiety about what fishing vessels would do if war broke out. And they were pretty certain that the Soviets knew where the Sosa stations were. They didn't know that, but they suspected they did. Um, the problem was this. The diesel engines and fishing vessels were identical to the diesel engines in Soviet submarines. So if you get an acoustic kit through SOSIS, um, you don't know if it's a fishing vessel or a submarine. And in many cases throughout the crisis, there's a lot of contacts that actually turned out to be fishing vessels and not submarines. But they didn't know that at the time. And of course, they have to check all these contacts because they don't know what it is and they have to be sure in case it's a missile boat. Not all fishing vessels, but but a good portion of them. And also, it's another thing. Uh, a lot of the, the radar in the Soviet fishing vessels was identical to the radar used in Soviet submarines. So if you get an ECM hit of radar, you think it's a submarine, but it's not necessarily a submarine. It could also be a fishing vessel. So this whole thing added a dimension to the, the crisis that it's a large, for Canada's aspect, naval aspect, it's a large surveillance operation. We have to know where those contacts are. So we're surveilling the areas, especially in the areas where SOSIS beds lay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, chalk that up to lessons learned uh, in the midst of the operation. Uh, the fishing vessels, the trawlers, a lot of them were actually um, spy, spy boats as well, uh, correct? I mean, they were. That's an added menace. Is a lot of those trawlers are actually Soviet assets in a sense, not just. Oh, for sure. And yeah. there, there was there was a report written by Admiral Dyer in 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 uh, in June 1962, so just before the crisis, and he spells out the threat of a Soviet fishing uh, fishing fleet. And there's examples where they were they were almost certain they cut the the uh, the anti ballistic missile radar system lines between Labrador and Greenland. In 1958, I believe, or no, 1961. Sorry, they uh, we have there were photographs taken of fishing vessels with with North Atlantic cables over their stern. So they were either cutting them or inspecting them or doing something to them. And this was happening all the time. Uh, Soviet fishing vessels were were putting into out ports and things like that against the law. They were using their radios in, in Canadian harbors, which they weren't supposed to be doing. In Halifax, certain fishing vessels were seen to have people in naval uniforms on their decks. So there was increased, increased anxiety. And, and the problem is this, if, if there's hundreds of these fishing vessels out there, how do you prevent them from doing something if war suddenly breaks out? It, it's an, an immense, immense challenge and it's an immense, immense threat if they're doing things like destructing the SOSIS network. Are there still a lot of Russian fishing vessels off the Canadian coast? I mean, you've got that great fishery up there off Greenland. And... Yeah, well, it's it's not what it used to be, sadly. Uh, we do. I was out to sea, gosh, when was it? 1992, I spent a week out to sea. And I remember on a nice sunny day in the Canadian destroyer, seeing about four or five very dilapidated looking Russian fishing trawlers and they're moving in a line and they're fishing and it's so they were there and you know and we, we sort of we were we were playing the red force in an exercise so we hit it amongst them so that was kind of fun um but yes they're still there yeah mm -hmm. well you mentioned on a political level there's more to be learned about the uh the intricacies of how that all unfolded and as there always will be between two uh independent nations when they pool their resources and the exigencies of the moment like this, but I, I get the impression from your article that on the naval level, uh, the cooperation was uh, quite seamless. And that has a lot to do, I think, with Admirals Taylor and Dyer uh, on the US and Canadian navies, respectively. Uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, Ken Dyer was a destroyer a captain from the Second World War. I think he got his first destroyer at 26 years old. He was an experienced naval officer. He was very, very highly regarded. He had a nice personality, he got along with people. Uh, I think he and Taylor had one of these wonderful relationships that's like this, where they just get along, and they they did. Um, you know, the fact that Taylor came up to talk to Dyer says so much, not just about the relationship between Canada and the United States and USN and the RCN, but also the respect they had for each other, you know? And during the crisis, Dyer went down to Norfolk at least once to talk to uh, 
to do a face-to-face. -face. And the reason he had to do that, I, I found this out in my research, there was no hotline between Halifax and Norfolk at that time. This is one of the lessons learned. The first One of the first things I did was we need a hotline between the two naval headquarters, for goodness sakes. So they did that. So if they're talking about things like SOSIS, they're not going to do that over a regular telephone line. So they have, to do it, they have to do it face to face. Like it's, SOSIS is a very, very, when I started working in the 1980s, you still couldn't say the word SOSIS. So that, that's how, how secret it was, confidential it was. So they got along very, very well. And, and Dyer also worked, and this is one of the Canadian misinterpretations of the, of the, the crisis, I'll, I'll say. And that's that Dyer essentially acted on his own in Halifax and didn't get support from Ottawa. I was at a conference in Shearwater 2019 and uh, I was sitting down with a former naval aviator and I was talking to him about his time during Cuba and he says yeah I remember on, on six years old today it would have been October 18th I jumped in a T-33 jet and flew to Halifax and I had Admiral Dyer in the back seat so as soon as Taylor left um, Halifax Dyer went to Ottawa to Naval Headquarters to talk about the situation. And people say, you know, Dyer wasn't supported. I'll tell you this, in, in, in the British naval tradition, I think the American as well, if you send a signal to your superior and say, I intend to, you know, intend to put out this patrol, um, if they don't say anything back, that means they approve. And during the crisis, we have a file where I work, and there are 54 messages from Admiral Dyer to Ottawa, and many of them start with intend, and he's telling them exactly what he's doing. He's telling them exactly what submarine and fishing boat contacts he's getting. It's 54 over a three-week period. And you do the math, that's two a day, more than two a day. So it's quite significant. And many of these messages, and this is where you get to the political aspect again, were copied to the Minister of National Defense within headquarters. So we know he saw them. So in other words, Ottawa is fully devolved in what Dyer is doing and they're giving their approval. Mm -hmm. But they don't, it's tacit approval if they don't answer no. Is that the idea? I can I can see how that decreases the methods traffic by half, which is probably a good thing. Exactly, yeah, considering exactly. The situation. You know, and, and signals don't don't automatically get you in 30 seconds. Sometimes they take, you know, because right. of transmission issues, whatever, in the 1960s, it can take some time for signals to get through. Mm -hmm. um, well, after this all, uh, you know, the world was able to stand down from this brinksmanship and uh, look like we're not going to blow ourselves up quite yet. Uh, <laughs> this still remained a classified thing. I mean, it, it, there wasn't any kind of like... Um, fanfare for Canada's um, important part in all this after it all was done, it seems like. Uh, they kept this under wraps. Yeah, the story didn't come out, Eric, until 1985 when a historian named Tony German, who was also Canada destroyer during the crisis, uh, wrote a book, A History of the Canadian Navy, and he talked about it then. And that's when it first really became public. The book became a bestseller. But uh, in Canada, um, the Navy is not high on anybody's agenda in either its history or, or what it's doing currently. So even then, it didn't get a lot of attention. Uh, you know, it wasn't picked up by the local news, for example, or the national news or anything like that. So the story is is, is, is largely unknown. And it's uh, it's unfortunate because it's, it's one of the, I think, bright shining moments in, in our naval history. And for that's for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, we reacted to a crisis very quickly and we got 26 what's the number 28 out of 38 ships to sea uh in the crisis on the atlantic coast uh very quickly and they were trained and they were capable most of them had very good equipment they were up to date we had a reputation then with the americans of being probably the finest two any submarine navies in the world we exercised together we worked together so we were good at what we did we worked well with the americans in, in, in anti-submarine warfare in particular and uh so it's it showed the capability of our navy and what we could do, and uh, it's sad that 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 has been lost to history. I think. Well, we're glad to um, finally shed some light on it in the magazine, and um, of a story as well, in, in the sense that the U.S. Navy and the Royal Canadian Navy, um, in this moment, is this, the better part of a fortnight in this really dire moment, became kind of the North American Navy, and. Uh, uh, people sleeping in their beds at home uh, have no idea of uh, how crucial all that sort of thing is, but it's going on out there at sea, even uh, outside of the eyes of people seeing it and not thinking about it. It's still important. 
Yeah. Uh, and for uh, people who read naval history, uh, we always like to say how history is not ever finished and it's it's not all written yet. And um, so it's always really exciting when we find uh, some new uh, hitherto largely ignored unsung aspect of an important chapter of larger history that is the naval component of it. And this checks all those boxes, man. I mean, and uh, the fact that we're seeing this now, I mean, right at an anniversarial year when we were um, going to cover this as much as we could anyway. And your timing was wonderful with this. It's part of a larger project you're working on. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we're, uh, I'm retiring next week, but we've been working for about the last 10 years on the 15 years on the official history of the Royal Canadian Navy from 1945 to 1968. So it's a Cold War history. And we stopped in 1968 because that's when we unified our armed forces and Royal Canadian Navy ceased to exist. It's, it now exists again. Um, they changed the name back. Uh, what we're able to do um, as an official historian, and that's what I am, an official historian, so I work for the government. Um, the government never tells me what to write. They never, ever have once. Uh, we did World War II histories. No one ever said, you know, don't say that. Um, we have access to all records. Uh, so I have a clearance, um, very high clearance, and so I can see everything. And uh, that has enabled us to, to open certain documents, especially like SOSIS, for example. We looked at that, and we put out some stuff on that. Um, so it's the research that my team has done um, has opened a lot of doors and windows into the Cold War and how navals, navies were thinking during the Cold War. For example, if you just look at procurement of warships, and, and everyone does this, of course, if you look at why Canada ordered certain destroyers and what they wanted in those destroyers, you understand how navies are thinking. So that's the sort of thing we go deep into because it tells us uh, how navies think. Can I say one more thing about the, the Cuban Missile Crisis? And this is, so we're, we're celebrating essentially the start of it today because it's the 22nd of, of October when Kennedy gives his speech. And I can't remember the exact date now. I have it. Where did I write it down? I didn't write it down. Anyways, Khrushchev announced, I'm pulling my missiles. Okay, so it's 13 days later. Um, the crisis did not end then. And, and as you'll appreciate, as your audience will appreciate, disengagement is one of the most difficult, difficult military and naval operations. So just because Khrushchev says, I'm pulling my missiles and you have to, what did Reagan say? Trust, but verify. Well, 1962, Kenny's probably think don't trust better verify. Okay. Cause it's, they're still concerned. And so for another two weeks until 10th November, they took down the Stonewall barrier. American and Canadian forces are still engaged in, in, sustained anti-submarine warfare on the North Atlantic. They didn't stop when Khrushchev said, we're pulling out the missiles. This operation continued and continued until mid-October. I've been to November, sorry. And there were Soviet AGIs that we trailed around the Canland zone until the, the end of November because we were still concerned. And so the crisis kept, for the Navy's concerned, the crisis kept on going. And the only real problem between Ottawa and Dyer in Halifax was when Khrushchev says, I'm pulling the missiles, uh, the Navy wanted Dyer to cut back his operations because it was costing money and they're using fuel and blah, blah. They're using thousands of Sonoboys, thousands of them. Um, stocks were running low. So they tried to get Dyer to cut back his operations. Uh, he said, you really can't do that. And George, uh, sorry, uh, Whitey, Whitey Taylor, sent a signal to Dyer, which Dyer obviously sent to Ottawa saying, look, we need you guys to keep up your operations into November because this isn't over. And that letter from Whitey Taylor to Admiral Dyer, which found its way to Ottawa, shows the cooperation and also shows the reliance the Americans were, were, were placing on Canada. Absolutely. Well, you're working on a larger Cold War project that's incredibly fascinating to me because... Um, the fact that now is the time we can finally start researching and really writing the Cold War histories. Uh, yeah. so much, there was this much to know, and there's this much we did know until, you know, the declassification of file. It's a gold mine period for researching and writing about Cold War history, and there's so much there that people don't know yet. And, uh, it's oh, you a have no idea. field to be in. You have no idea. No. It, it, it's, uh, and you know, uh, because of, I have to be careful how I say this, because of US classification laws, I can't see, I can't 
see documents that relate to our operations with the Americans. Okay. I, some I can, but I can't use them often. Uh, so it's, it's a real tricky thing. And it's, you know, we're struggling with, we called access to information in Canada, where we try to open up documents and uh, we've been pretty successful in doing that, but there's still an awful lot that, that isn't released. And, and this is also in the UK. It's also in the United States. It's everywhere. And, and of course there's the whole, I mean, there's a debate over how many submarines were in the, in the Northwest Atlantic. When the first histories were written on the Canada's role in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, 20 years ago, uh, people estimated there were as many as five to seven or eight Soviet submarines in the Canland zone. And my research would indicate there were none. Uh, but we don't know because we can't get into Russian records. And, and of course, then if we get into Russian records, I know Norman Palmer has been very successful working with Russian historians and has I, what Norman says I think is right. There were five submarines in the North Atlantic throughout the crisis, the four foxtrots down around Cuba that you guys surfaced and a Zulu that was caught uh, in the mid-Atlantic at the start of the crisis, but it went home. Um, so until we see Soviet records, you know, we don't know exactly what they were doing. Interesting enough, a great resource for looking at the Soviet side of things is through CIA documents because they got a hold, they put these online, God bless them. They put um, a lot of Soviet journal uh, articles about the crisis online and you can find them. And it's fascinating what they reveal. And, and it's not a surprise when you think about it. So you had all these American and Canadian naval forces surging into the North Atlantic. Well, what are the Soviets going to do? They're going to listen. And so they picked up communications intelligence like crazy. And they would probably went back and analyze this, as did we, obviously. We did the same thing. But so they would learn a lot about the cycle of our operations and, and how we searched things and where we, we were, where we deployed our forces just by being out there and watching and listening. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm extolling the uh, ability to look at the classified files, but you make a very good point. <laughs> They're not all declassified yet. No. No, but it's getting there over time. I mean, we're, we just we started this with the, uh, talking about JFK and uh, his sad uh, finale in life. Um, there are reams of documents still un, still classified on that. And um, yeah. believe me, there are armies of researchers waiting for them to declassify it. So, yeah. you know, every so often something else gets declassified. And I remember when the Soviet archives originally opened in uh, 1995. That was the first wave of this stuff, right? Suddenly we're seeing a whole Cold War and a whole new broad yeah. perspective. And uh, it's a shame if that spigot's been turned off again, but uh, maybe uh, some at some point again, we have access to stuff. Uh, but um, how about the Canadian uh, archives as far as declassification goes? Is there a lot yet to be done um, on that front or? Yeah, I have to be very careful here. <laughs> there, oh, if, if you can't, no, no, it's fine. It, it's through our ETI process, the problem we're having right now, and this has largely happened as a result of the pandemic, where you know I have a very good friend who who, who lives in Luxembourg who just has a master's thesis in, in naval history. He couldn't get any documents because he couldn't get to the archives because they were closed. So what that created in Canada, and I'm guessing the United States and Great Britain as well, um, all these people corresponding asking to get records through our ETI system. And it's a wonderful system we have. You pay $5 and, and they declassify that document and send it to you if they can declassify it. Now, some cases they can't. But the main things we have trouble declassifying are any documents dealing with relations with allies, because that's not just us, that's other people's mm. information as well. So that's, and a lot of what we did was related to the United States. So you can see the problem there. But I'll give you an example with the SOSIS research I did about four or five years ago. We had this study in, in 1955 called the Seaward Defense Report. Now that sounds like anti-torpedo nets and coastal artillery. And that's what historians all assumed it was. And we had these Naval Board minutes, which Naval Board is a, the admirals that run the Navy. And they had these minutes and they talked about the, the Seaward Defense Plan. And nobody went and looked at the actual file. So one day I went down there to the National Archives, which is in Ottawa, and I ordered up this file and it was closed, but I have I could see it. And my eyes went like this and my jaw bounced off the table because it, what it actually was, was how the Royal Canadian Navy was going to incorporate SOSIS into its maritime defense plans. And the, the report was 100 pages. 
Okay. And it's, I deemed it so important. My boss has agreed. We, let's declassify this. So I sent off my $5. I did it personally rather than going through work because it'd be quicker. I sent off my $5 and about, I got one phone call. Can we release this? Yes. Okay. We can release this. And I got a CD a couple of days in the mail, which was a copy of the entire report. Mm. And, and so that's how our ETI system works. The problem is the backlogs now. Uh, by law, I think we had to respond to within 20 days, the ETI people to give you your stuff or at least process an answer. Uh, now it's it's taking months and months because of this backlog that's come from COVID and, and the pandemic. Yeah, I have, any, I have any number of authors who have articles, um, proposed articles that had to be put on hold because you couldn't get into the National Archives. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, that's, that's starting to happen again now, finally. I mean, things are starting to pick up, but I imagine all of those archives are just completely swamped with backlog requests. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we when we first opened up after the pandemic started to, to lighten, you had to make an appointment to go to the archives. Otherwise, you just wanted it in on a normal day. Now you have to make an appointment. So it's it's just the whole thing is much more structured. Uh, it'll change. It'll open up again. But it's just. Have we stopped? Have I lost you? No, oh, here we go. There we are. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we're back in action here. We just had the Good. hiccup there, the technological hiccup. Um, and you say the Canadian archives are in Ottawa? Ottawa, yes. Yeah. yeah. How far is that for you? Uh, that's about a, depending on the traffic, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday was about an hour, uh, half an hour. I'm just outside of town. Uh -huh. We have a very good archives. Uh, we, you know, as part of our research into the post-war naval history and World War II, we we go to American archives. We go to because so much of what Canada does as a as a navy, the Royal Canadian Navy, is related to other countries' navies. Like so, when I when I you know study the Canadian Navy in the Second World War, I better know the Royal Navy too, and I better know the, the United States Navy in the Atlantic, anyways. And then so we, mm -hmm. when we do our research, we have to very much get into the other countries' archives. And of course, uh, in the Second World War, we were able to get into German archives and, you know, we, we copied almost every U-boat log. So when a, an attack took place on a North Atlantic convoy, we could look up the U-boat report as well as the escorts report, which is fascinating. That's the best history in the world. Yeah, well, Canada, you, could, you, you all are in, instrumental in the Battle of the Atlantic and there's convoy routes and all that as, as well. Um, there's a lot of rich Canadian uh, naval history. We'd like to get more of it in the magazine. So keep us in mind. Um, I will. If you uh, unearth any other Cold War hitherto unknown discoveries, we want to know about it. Uh, and um, well, listen, uh, it's been great to have you here, Michael. I can't think of a more interesting way to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years on to the day, as you point out, than looking at a fresh new angle of it and uh, Canada's uh, great contribution in those 13 dark days in 1962. Thank you for uh, enlightening our readers about this, Michael, and uh, thank you for joining us today. We hope to have you on again sometime because you have another article with us sometime. Um, this, Michael Whitby is the senior naval historian with the Canadian Department of National Defense. Um, he soon will be uh, retired and able to write and research to his heart's content. Congratulations you got it. On that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's been great talking with you today. And uh, best of uh, luck with your larger projects you're working on. We'll be curious to see how that turns out. Thanks, Eric. This has been a real pleasure. It's, it's, it's nice to get the story out. For us as well. And uh, you have a great October 2022 versus 1952, <laughs> and we'll try to do so as well. I guess that's it for us today, folks. Um, well, thank you for joining us for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. Uh, brought up to you, of course, by the U.S. Naval Institute. Uh, we invite you to become a part of the dis larger discussion of naval issues past, present, and future. And the best way to do that is become a member of the U.S. Naval Institute. Become part of the conversation yourself. Uh, just look at the Chiron there and go to that prompt. And we'll have you on board. Uh, until next time, fair winds and following seas, folks. And um, we look forward to seeing you again here very, very soon. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, signing out. Goodbye. <laughs>